This is my SLR 106 FR. F for the folding stock and R for the side rail. This rifle is essentially a Bulgarian made clone of the Russian made AK-101 rifle. And it's chambered in 5.56 NATO. This is an unusual caliber to see in an AK and it intrigued me into configuring a modernized AK that bridged both east and west together. In this video, I will be taking you on a detailed journey of the modifications I have chosen, going piece by piece and explaining my reasoning behind each one. Beginning by showing you its factory configuration, what it is today, and what I might change about it in the future. This rifle originally came with black polymer furniture and a 100 series folding stock. It also came with a traditional styled pistol grip, which I later replaced with the US Palm AK grip. This is a much bigger pistol grip, and it's angled for your index finger to come in line straight with the trigger. And the large hump makes the rifle much easier to hold one handed. Moving on over to the safety selector, I chose a Kreps Custom Safety. This allows you to manipulate the safety with the flick of your finger instead of having to break your grip and use your whole hand. Next up is the RP1 charging handle. This covers the normal charging handle and makes it more user friendly. The stock charging handle is much skinnier and sharper. The RP1 adds more girth and length giving you a larger area to grip when charging the rifle. This is truly an improved part. It really does allow you to get purchase on this quicker. I have to say, I maintain my initial perception of that, which is that's a super redneck part. Moving up to the front end of the rifle, I have a BCM Mod 3 grip. This is a small, short, lightweight grip that is just what I need to control the front end of the rifle. The size of the vertical grip also doesn't interfere with magazine changes. Before we talk about the stock on this rifle, we need to go back in time a little bit. This triangle folding stock is the most dated part on this rifle, being designed in the early 70s. I think its old age adds a little soul to it, and this old stock actually looks pretty good on a modern rifle. But putting cosmetics aside, there are some actual practical reasons to use this stock too. For example, it's actually lighter weight than the previous polymer stock. Along with that, it's actually extremely sturdy folded and unfolded. And unlike a DI gun, you can shoot the rifle while it's folding. I have also added a rifle dynamic stock pouch, which gives the stock a little bit of insulation and some storage space. With this extra storage space, I keep a cleaning kit and a few spare batteries. One unusually modern feature on this old stock is the placement of the sling swivel. It's in the correct position to mount a modern two-point sling. The sling I have chosen is the Blue Force Gear AK sling. This is a two-point sling that has a quick adjustment feature. This allows you to comfortably adjust the sling for whatever activity you're doing.
I will now begin telling you about the internal changes I have made to this rifle. Starting at the trigger, I have an ALG AKT trigger. This is a much lighter breaking trigger compared to the old stock trigger. The shorter reset on this trigger also helps to make faster follow up shots. The trigger install was pretty simple, but I would recommend buying a retaining pin along with your new trigger. This will allow you to ditch the old shepherd's hook, which is pretty infuriating to reinstall. Along with this new trigger and retaining pin, I also changed the hammer spring to an ALG AK high energy mainspring. One of the biggest internal changes on this rifle was switching the original chrome piston to a KNS adjustable gas piston. This allows you to adjust the amount of gas feeding back into the system and cycling the bolt. But over gassing on this gun wasn't really a huge problem until I changed out the original AK-74 muzzle brake to an Armacon Volks flash suppressor. This flash suppressor dramatically reduced the muzzle flash compared to the old muzzle brake which created some huge fireballs. Another huge advantage this flash suppressor provides is the reduction of concussive blast. This makes it way more enjoyable for shooters and people standing around you. It also reduces kicking up debris while shooting. But there are a few downsides to using this muzzle device, one of which is that it weighs a lot more than the muzzle brake, and adding weight to the very front of your rifle doesn't make it balance very well. This flash suppressor also doesn't bleed gas out of the front of the muzzle like the AK-74 brake. This creates more back pressure on the gun, making the gun cycle harder than needed. This does increase reliability, but it makes the gun more punchier and puts more strain on the internals, specifically the rear trunnion. This is where the KNS adjustable gas piston really shines. It removes this punchiness when you turn down the gas. The final internal part I'll be discussing are the magazines. If you've ever watched a review video on a 5.56 AK, you probably know that they need their own dedicated 5.56 magazines. So if you have any cool 5.45 Bakelite mags lying around, you can't use any of them. This used to be a huge weakness to this rifle because if you wanted a good reliable 5.56 magazine, your really only option was a $50 Circle 10 mag. This has since changed however, nowadays there are many more magazine options for these rifles. A much cheaper option is the translucent green WBP magazine. It runs at a much more affordable $15 and it's actually much lighter than the beefy Circle 10 mag. The handguard I'm using is the Zenico Sport 4 kit. 
It's a lightweight aluminum rail with lots of vents for cooling and uses the basis attachment system. Think of this as the Russian version of M-Lock, but it's not compatible with M-Lock and it's supposedly more durable. But just like M-Lock, it allows you to place a Picatinny rail piece almost anywhere on the handguard. I use two B2L rails to attach my vertical grip and my flashlight. The reason I chose this almost full length handguard was because it allowed me to mount the flashlight so close to the muzzle of the rifle. This removes most of the shadowing from its barrel. Another reason I chose the Zenico handguard was so I could mount a B33 dust cover. This thick dust cover adds a huge amount of Picatinny rail space to the top of your rifle. But most importantly, it holds zero. Even after opening and closing it hundreds of times, it still holds. The reason for its reliability is that it's mounted directly to the handguard. And this hinging feature also simplifies the gun a lot more. Now the dust cover is an attached piece of the gun. Also unlike a side rail, the dust cover doesn't interfere with the folding stock. This allows you to retain your optic while having the stock closed. And the optic I am using is the EOTech EXPS2. This is a huge improvement over the standard AK iron sights. The EOTech's big blocky design provides a large window with a great field of view. It's also extremely durable. And its large donut reticle also helps a lot in lower lighting conditions. Speaking of low lighting conditions, let's talk about the flashlight I'm using. I'm using the Arasaka 600 series IR light. This light has some decent throw and spill to it. It's also very reliable and lightweight and accepts surefire tail caps and heads. I actually replaced the pressure tail cap that came with the light and replaced it with the surefire UE tail cap. But along with this flashlight, I also have a laser unit attached to this rifle. This is the Russian made Purst 4. This powerful laser allows you to make hits without using your sights or even shouldering the gun. The only problem I've encountered is that this laser beam does have a little bit of spill to it. But I have found a solution to correcting some of the spill by buying a 3D printed laser cover. But there's also a huge advantage to this Russian made laser compared to other American made full powered lasers. The Purst 4 isn't regulated by ITAR because it's foreign made. This means you don't need any special qualifications to own and you can simply order it right off eBay. So having my light and laser mounted to the very end of my rifle caused some ergonomic challenges. How I control the light and the laser is by using a modified Surefire dual pressure pad. But the Surefire dual pressure pad isn't compatible with the Burst 4. So I removed the plug-in off the Zenico pressure pad and then I cut the PEC-15 plug-in on the Surefire pressure pad and soldered on the Zenico plug-in for the Burst 4. With all that complete, I did some cable management by using small zip ties 
to fix the cable tightly to the rail. And the final thing I failed to mention about the light and the laser is that they both have an infrared option. This infrared light is invisible to the human eye and can only be seen with night vision devices. Большие города, пустые поезда, ни берега, ни дна, все начинать сначала, холодная война. Now that I've explained everything on this rifle, I'm going to tell you a few things that I think I might change in the future. One of which is getting a night vision compatible EOTech. The one in the video is not night vision compatible and is a little bit too bright for night vision. Another thing would be getting a suppressor for it. Suppressing this rifle would reduce the flash even more. And because I already have an adjustable gas piston, the overgassing caused by the suppressor won't be a problem. 
I was also thinking about spray painting this gun in some kind of camouflage pattern to break up the obvious black outline. And another thing would be getting an AR buffer tube stock. It would uh, have a better length of pull, better cheek weld, and the metal stock can also get kind of slippery on your shoulder. So this rifle build and video was heavily inspired by Oxide. So if you haven't seen any of his videos, I highly recommend you watch those next. And if you didn't like this review, I suggest you watch my next one, which will be much more American. Mm -hmm.